To get hit on the right cheek is to get hit by a backhand. One who gets hit on the right cheek by a backhand is one who is at the power of the oppressor. Often the way in which an owner would hit a slave with a backhand. Nobody in that time would ever hit anybody with their left hand. So when Jesus says to turn the other cheek, he doesn't mean just turn around and get pummeled. He says, here's the deal now, if you wanna hit me on this cheek, you gotta do it with a closed fist. We're now equals. I have dignity too. Jesus is teaching his followers in the midst of oppression that this is how you resist evil and stand against it being done to you. They might continue to hit you, but now they are not hitting you as one who has power over you, but as equals, both of you with your dignity restored. Jesus is always subverting the power structure. The second thing that Jesus goes on to do, he says, give up your coat. They take you to court, which someone who has power is able to do, take you to court and they steal your shirt. He's like, well, just give them your coat too. And we're like, ah, what? Just give them more clothes? Is that what we're supposed to do? No, the, the coat, the outer coat, had a different kind of meaning to a first century person. It was the most expensive garment that they owned. And it was used for a lot of things. It was used for like a blanket or a sleeping bag as well as this outer coat. So he says, if you lose your shirt, give them your coat. But what's interesting about that is first century people didn't spend a whole lot of time wearing underwear. It's not really a thing. Your, your shirt that you, they took from you was like your undergarment. So he's saying, when they take your shirt, get naked. And it's that like weirdly subversive thing. Because what happened in that culture when you were naked is that you were not the one who was in fact shamed. Those who looked on you were the ones who were shamed. They did not want to look at a naked person walking down the street. So if you've been sued for your shirt and you give your coat and you're like, all right, I'm out. And you're just a naked person walking down the street. And I think Jesus means it to be this silly too. Right, like now everybody is going, hold on, why is there a naked person walking down the street? Who took his stuff? Get it back to him. You've again, you've subverted the power structure and you've given those who are at the mercy of the powers that be a way to resist without violence. And then his third example is to go another mile with a Roman guard who's asked, you to carry his stuff. And what's interesting about this is we're pretty familiar with the phrase, go the extra mile, right? Go the extra mile. I mean, I was a basketball coach for seven years and I was like, hey guys, we gotta go the extra mile. And they're like, do you mean run more? Yes, but we're gonna go the extra mile. We just thought it means work harder, right? Just, just, just keep going a little farther than you thought you could go. Jesus means something completely different when he talks about going the extra mile. See, again, in the first century, a Roman guard by rule of the Roman guard and law could ask a citizen, typically a Jewish citizen, to carry their gear for one mile. And what was often the case, there were mile markers always on the road, so you knew when a mile was up. And what would typically happen, I'm sure, is that this one officer would say, carry my gear, and you would be like, I have to. And you would grumpily carry it, and you'd get to your mile marker, and you knew it, and he knew it, and you'd throw it down, and you'd carry on your way. Like, dang, the man got me again. Another thing that just reminds me that I'm not free, that I don't have worth, that I don't have dignity. So now Jesus says, okay, well, when they ask you to do that, go another mile. But he wasn't just asking his followers to do that because they needed to be servant hearted. He was upending the power structures in play that were oppressing them. The moment that they began to carry an officer's gear another mile, now the officer was in a bind because they had a strict rule 
that you could only force a citizen to take it one mile. They were in a place in which now they were going to be in trouble if you kept carrying their gear. And so now you're carrying their gear an extra mile and they're like, hey, you need to put my gear down. You're like, no, I got it, right? And everybody's looking at them and immediately the whole thing's been flipped upside down and you've reasserted that you have dignity as well. You've flattened the power hierarchy at play. Do you think that that officer is going to ask you to carry his gear again? No, he doesn't wanna deal with that. Jesus is saying, here's another way to resist the evil being done to you. You see, you see how upside down all of this is. And yet at this point in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he still has not used the word love. It's interesting how Jesus is about to introduce us to the power of a concept. The, the fulcrum of the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount swings on this concept of love. What's he gonna do with that? Here's what he says next. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in that way. You will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are only kind to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. To call forth an enemy was not an empty concept to these disciples. They knew an enemy. Jesus himself knew what an enemy was. And yet he still takes this resistance piece a step further. And what he does is he reinitiates us with the foundation of all of his teaching, love. According to Jesus, the biblical test case for love of God is love of neighbor. And the biblical test case for love of neighbor is love of enemy. This is what it all comes down to. 